I'm Betty Hay Freeland. I'm a landscape artist. I work with oils on canvas, and I really love the beauty of Hawaii. That's just been my inspiration for decades now of painting. And uh, I love, I, I see Hawaii and I, I see it without buildings and without the, the new Hawaii. And uh, we have such beautiful sunlight and beautiful mountains and we're so, I think, I am very grateful that I live here on Maui. And I was born on the Big Island. I've always been, you know, here except for three or four years off at college. And just happy that this is our environment. So for this exhibit, I contacted the Hawaiian Island Land Trust about uh, painting there and getting more information on the Waihe'e area, which I really wasn't very familiar with. And so I worked with Denby Freeland there, who is my daughter, who is their educational coordinator, and Scott Fisher, who's in charge of the Hawaiian Island Land Trust. He's Dr. Scott Fisher. And they gave me two tours of this area explaining it all to me. And this, for instance, is what was a servant's home for at the time when that area started, there was a sugar plantation as well as the Hawaiian Land Trust uh, area. And this was one of two homes that's left there with the doctor's previous house. And then this comes into the land trust area and the, the water system that provided the growth that was there. And there's a whole history on these sand dunes, which Scott explains very well in, in part of this whole presentation. I love the mountains of Hawaii and so Maui and these West Maui mountains and the waterfall that came through as a source of water. And then these sand dunes, I have an amazing history. They start here and they go all the way across Wailuku and down to Ma'alaya. And um, now with conservation, they're getting things to come back and to grow again. But there's an awful lot of history there. Well, I would say a, a, a basis for all of this love of Hawaii and everything is the understanding and the respect I have for ancestors who worked to, you know, help Hawaii develop. Some, some worked in government, uh, worked in plantations. And so it was always dealing with the land is what I heard about. And we always were out there, you know, appreciating everything that Hawaii had. Um, I have uh, part Hawaiian relatives on two and three generations back, and I've never, I've never really traced it back further than that. And so um, I'm part Hawaiian, my husband's part Hawaiian, and all of the sets of grandparents are. So some of the Caucasians came from Scotland and England, but they met married Hawaiian ladies and here we all are. <laughs>
so much history here. I've also wanted to do a painting out across the ocean here with Haleakala in the background. And that hasn't worked out because there's always been a big wind going and I haven't been able to do it as yet. But I have the canvas ready. So that'll be another project. Um, I'm, having, I'm going to restore some of the wetlands that were in here, which are now covered with growth. So there, there I get my artistic license to patch it together and I'll put a little bit more lauhala in here and some of the clusters of taro that grew. But um, yeah, it's a wonderful spot and I urge people to come and visit. So I'm Denby Freeland. I'm the education coordinator here at Waihe'e Refuge. I work with Hawaii Land Trust. And um, this property is one of the sites that the organization owns. It's about 270 acres. And uh, this was a site that my mom chose to collaborate with, uh, partly because there is so much history and there's so many unique aspects about this property. And she hadn't really spent much time here and hadn't really learned much about the site herself. And so it was an opportunity for her to become more familiar with this area. So we came down a couple times and just walked around a little bit. And I was telling her a little bit more about uh, the fishing village that used to be here, um, that, you know, this is part of Waihe'e Ahupua'a. Um, the Lokui Akalo, the pond that was here for growing fish and taro. Uh, the reef that's out here is a very extensive reef. It's the largest fringing reef on Maui. So we talked about the history of the reef and the beach and the geology of that and the cultural history of that. Um, and as we were walking around and I was talking about different things of the property, there's some, there's a payout that's further out. And as we were in different spots, she, I, every time I looked at her, she was always looking back at the sand dunes and the mountains. And so that was definitely something that was capturing her attention. And I, even though I was talking about the ocean or something else, I'd turn around, she's always looking back this way. So the sand dunes are definitely a significant aspect of this property. This sand dune system used to extend about 11 and a half miles. It started out here next to Waihe'e Stream at the far end of the refuge. And it used to extend out across central Maui towards Ma'alaya. So this section here is the last segment that's left of that system. It's called Mauna Ihi. And um, that name reveals a lot about how the sand dunes were looked at because ihi means sacred. But the fact that it was also called mauna says a lot because the sand dunes are not a mountain, they're a pu'u. But them being given that mauna status shows that the Hawaiians recognized how unusual and special this feature was of the sand dunes. And when we first came out, it was the summer months. It was a little drier. The sand dunes were a little bit more distinct than they are right now. We've had some rain, so they do have a little bit of, a um, little more greenery on them. But she's able to depict the sand dunes in their more sandy state in her painting, um, as well as using a little artistic license for that, since they aren't that sandy at the moment. Hello, my name is Scott Fisher. I'm the uh, Chief Conservation Officer for the Hawaii Land Trust. And I'm here at the Waihe'e Coastal Dunes and Wetlands Refuge. And of course, behind me, uh, well, is Biddy Hay Freeland painting uh, an, an amazing uh, landscape painting of uh, the Waihe'e Refuge. And uh, further behind me, though, are the, are the wetlands and the uh, the dunes which give the, the name to the Waihe'i Coastal Dunes and Wetlands Refuge. The wetlands are about 27 acres. Uh, we have spent the last 17 years uh, actively involved in restoring the uh, native vegetation and restoring the, uh, the as much as we can the original hydrology of the area so uh, the structure function and composition of the ecosystem. The dunes behind me are uh, mythologically are said to have been created by the goddess Haumea. So the goddess Haumea is the goddess of childbirth 
and delivered a, a child on the island of Molokai and was given uh, a sacred tree as an offering, as a ho'okupu. And that sacred tree, known as Kalau Ke Kahuli, was brought from Molokai to uh, Maui and she searched all over for the proper place on, on Maui to plant it and finally decided that the place to plant it would be at Waihe'e on a hill known as Pu'ukuma which is almost directly behind me just just uh, very near the uh, the Waihe'e school Waihe'e elementary school so that that plan uh, excuse me that that tree was planted there and then because of this uh, the persistent winds that blow at Waihe'e known as the Kamakani Kili O'opu uh, she decided that she needed to build a, a, a protection, a barrier from that wind for, uh, in order to protect the, uh, the sacred tree, Kalau Ke Kahuli. So she started at uh, Kalaika Ho'omano, which is the, the point right by the ocean, uh, just, to my, just to my left, and built up this whole dune system that went from Kalaika Ho'omano over to Pihanakalani, uh, the, the, the dune system there, which is just above uh, the Wailuku stream. So that, that was one system that was, that was designed to protect the, the sacred tree. Uh, of course, around the 1500s in this wetlands uh, was constructed a, uh, a fish pond known as a loko iakalo, uh, or a, a dual-use fish pond where, where fish were raised as well as taro being grown. And so when we cleared out the, the invasive species, the la'au opala, the ones that we want to get out, we actually found the mounds that were used to, uh, were used to plant that taro. And so the, the water would flow between those mounds where the taro would be planted and then the fish could, could be grown um, along with them. So uh, a very dynamic aquaculture system that was extremely productive. There are a number of real important reasons to actually uh, protect wetlands. Uh, you know, they, they are very important to, to the land. So what we've realized over the last 50 or so years in the conservation, in the field of conservation, is that wetlands function a lot like a, how your kidneys function in your body. So they, they take all that, that sediment, the lepo, and they prevent it, they retain it long enough that it doesn't get out into the ocean. So uh, wetlands protection is very, very important. Um, across the archipelago, so we need to um, constantly uh, move to preserve that ecosystem. But more importantly, or perhaps equally important, is the fact that it is habitat for a number of, of endangered species. So of all the water birds Hawaii has, including uh, the Papahanao Mokuakea uh, part of the uh, archipelago, has seven uh, water birds. Of those seven, six are endangered. And so, and uh, two of those are, are permanently or near permanently found here. Uh, we see occasional visits by others, uh, but what we can do is by restoring the ecosystem, we actually improve their habitat. And by improving their habitat, increase the likelihood that they will survive uh, into the future. We're constantly doing outreach. We want to get uh, students of all ages out here, and that's really Denby's critical role is that the more people understand what this area is, we are certain that they will come to love this area as much as we do. And we only protect those things that we, we know and we only know those things that we actually have access to. And so it's that, you know, we, we, we love what we know, we protect what we love. And so we wanna make sure that we emphasize that. And so that's, that's the critical aspect of getting people on the land.